The war had entered into us like wine. We had set out in a rain of flowers to seek the death of heroes. The war was our dream of greatness, power, and glory. It was a man's work, a duel on fields whose flowers would be stained with blood. There is no lovelier death in the world. Ernst Younger's recollections of the Great War's commencement failed to capture the range of emotions that accompanied men to the front in August 1914 and throughout the Great War. For every soldier who welcomed the opportunity to face death and prove himself on the battlefield, another trembled at the prospect of not returning home. Nonetheless, Younger's comments reveal something significant about social expectations in the period before Europe descended into more than four years of conflict. War was indeed a man's work, and even the most reluctant warrior understood what was expected when he encountered the enemy. Firmly entrenched social mores demanded that men exhibit honor and courageousness on the battlefield. Soldiers, including citizen soldiers, realized that their peers expected them to fight bravely and willingly give their lives in defense of the fatherland. Falling into enemy hands did not merely physically remove soldiers from the battlefield, it severed their psychological connections to the higher purpose upon which their sense of manhood depended. My name is Brian Feltman, and I'm an assistant professor of history at Georgia Southern University. The title of my book is The Stigma of Surrender, German Prisoners, British Captors, and Manhood in the Great War and Beyond. My relationship with the University of North Carolina Press began when my manuscript was selected as the winner of the Kaufman Prize, which is the Society for Military History's prize for the best first manuscript. The press was interested in the manuscript because we are in the middle of celebrating the 100th anniversary of the outbreak of the First World War. My interest in prisoners of war started when I discovered that one of my ancestors had served in the American Civil War and had become a prisoner of war at the end of the conflict. And when I went to speak to one of my history professors about this uh, as an undergraduate, his response uh, to the fact that my ancestor had been a prisoner of war left me feeling uh, a little ashamed about, uh, about the fact that that, that was, was how my uh, ancestor had finished the conflict. And so I started asking questions about why. Why did I have those feelings? It made me wonder exactly what it meant to become a prisoner of war. I wanted to really try to find out more about what the experience of captivity meant for the prisoners themselves. And the best way that I found to do that was to look at their correspondence, the letters that they had written from captivity. And I was able to, to locate um, just over a thousand letters. I, I found uh, a series of letters from one particular uh, soldier. You see the first letter that he sends home where he's telling his family that he's alive and that they, they can contact him as often as they would like. And then you see that his family continues to live without him. And so he's waiting anxiously for news from them and his responses to them demonstrate his, his real um, sadness at not being able to be there with his family. And then also these letters show how distraught he is over the fact that he can't be in the front line with his comrades. But after the Second World War, we start to see um, a fading of that stigma. We start to see a change to the point where today prisoners of war are, are universally celebrated. This book really attempts to bridge the gap between military history and social history. To show us not only what it meant to be a prisoner of war during the First World War, but what it meant to be a man at war. <laughs>